Bartlett. I'm very happy to have you all here. Uh, happy to be running this joint symposium between the Institute for Foundations of Machine Learning and the uh, Computational Complexity of Statistical Inference program that we've been running this semester. Uh, it's brought about 80 people, uh, long-term visitors to, to Berkeley. Um, uh, welcome to all the visitors from IFML and a big thank you to IFML for uh, its support of, of this symposium this week. Very excited to have you here. Um, I should start by saying a big, uh, big thank you to the organizers, Adam Clivens, Jerry Lee and Slil Shrum. Thanks to those. You did a great job. Looks like an exciting, exciting symposium. Um, uh, Adam's going to say a few words to introduce the symposium in a moment. Um, I have to tell you about some of the logistics. Uh, so please don't bring food and, and coffee into the auditorium. Uh, water's fine. Uh, the, the rules about masking uh, have changed in Alameda County, but not yet in the university. So we all need to wear masks inside. Um, if you're heading out for lunch or other times, there are, there are lockers on the far side of the building, on the ground floor, you're welcome to use those. Uh, um, Omid Farr, our videographer here is gonna be helping speakers out with hooking up their, their computers. Um, uh, and of course, a big thank you to Kelani Penland, our uh, uh, events coordinator for all the local arrangements. Thanks, Kelani. to cut with a microphone. All right, Adam, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Clivens. And uh, uh, Nati was asking me, what is IFML? And as Peter just said, we're the national, uh, the NSF National AI Institute for the Foundations of Machine Learning. The NSF wanted to start a network of AI institutes. And so there are several now. We are the only AI institute whose theme is Foundations of Machine Learning. Um, Simon's Institute has always been, you know, to me, in, in my opinion, like the place to be if you want to do theory of machine learning. So we thought it made a lot of sense to have uh, a joint kind of meetup session here at Simon's Institute. Additionally, I'm also one of the organizers for this semester's program. Uh, thanks to Peter Bartlett. Uh, thank you so much for having us here, hosting the event, providing refreshments and logistics. That's awesome. It's also our first kind of in-person event. Uh, for IFML, our team members are primarily from UT Austin, UW, uh, Microsoft Research, and Wichita State University. So you'll see Microsoft Research right there. So we'll see, you'll see plenty of people from those institutes and um, institutions. And you know, um, hopefully you can uh, meet some people that you've only been able to Zoom with over the last two years. Um, our schedule today and throughout the week, we have. Two, only two talks scheduled for uh, the morning for each one of these days. And our thinking was that um, we wanted to leave all of you plenty of time in the afternoon to get good research done. And today in particular, we have a student poster session. Um, so that's a really important event. It'll be outside actually, Kehlani told me, uh, right over here, there will be refreshments. And that's your opportunity to you know, introduce yourself and, and tell everyone kind of what you're working on. And, and then we can spend sort of, you know, find out who you, uh, the right connections for you to work with for, for the rest of the week. So, um, it should, you know, that, that's the main event for today after, after our two talks that we'll be having. So, um, yeah, thanks again to the Simons Institute. And uh, we're excited to have uh, Ludwig here to kick us off. Also, if you want to check out any of our events, go to ifml.institute. It's our new website. Um, yeah, thanks for putting it up, Ludwig. So. Right, so um, I'm, yeah, this is a, a data-centric view of robustness uh, on robustness, and, and Ludwig from UW is here to give the talk. Thanks. Cool, excellent. Let's get started. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks a lot for organizing this. This is the first time I'm at a physical workshop in quite a while. Um, it may be true for many of you, so I'm excited to see people again in person. Okay, so this talk is going to be about robustness. So at the beginning, let's just have a brief look back about the, over the past few years of machine learning, why so many people are interested in robustness now. And then I'll tell you why I think data is a really, really important component there. Okay, I mean, this is not news to everyone. Anyone, there's been tons of interest, tons of excitement in the past 10 years in machine learning. If you sort of like peel back maybe the outer layer of excitement and hype, sort of what are the things that we've really made progress on? And then what you usually come back to is 
there are lots of data sets, lots of benchmarks that we've gotten really good at making the error numbers small. Like the prime example of this paradigm is ImageNet, right? There was the AlexNet breakthrough moment. And after that, people became really, really good at driving the error numbers down by some measure, take this with a grain of salt to superhuman performance. And this is not just ImageNet, obviously. This is sort of like one example of this entire paradigm. Like basically, there's a, there are websites like State of the Art ML where you can make these plots for all sorts of data sets. Like this is Pascal VOC, MS Coco. This is segmentation data set, Cityscapes. I think this is Squad, natural question answering. This is language modeling. This is machine translation and so forth. Okay, this is great. This is really, really good progress. The numbers get, keep getting better on data sets of 10 years ago, people thought were really hard. But then sort of like the natural question is, as the expectations around machine learning have grown and you start deploying these models, how good are these new classifiers really? And by now we've come to understand that actually just performance on a single test set, what you usually do in this benchmark paradigm, doesn't tell you the full story. I think a very nice case study here is self-driving cars around 2015. Everyone was excited by 2020, there will be self-driving cars. Elon Musk is particularly nice to pick on here a little bit uh, because his predictions have just always been very crisp. So for instance, early 2018, Elon Musk predicted that within half a year, there would be an autonomous Tesla coast to coast drive. Then 2018 passed, um, 2019, mid 2019 now, Elon tweets, parking lots are a remarkably hard problem. So instead of coast to coast, we now do parking lots. And he was going to do an engineering review later that day for enhanced summon. The idea being that you can call your Tesla to come to you from the other end of the parking lot. And then they released this a few months later. And then typically what happens of all of these Tesla releases, you have people post videos like this on YouTube fairly short shortly after the release. And here, the car would almost have hit another car if the person hadn't stopped it. So this is clearly still a very hard problem. And to be fair to Tesla, this is a hard problem for everyone. Lots of smart people are working on this. It just turns out making machine learning reliable in the real world is really tricky. And again, this is not just self-driving cars. This is a nice sort of like benchmark survey paper and extra image classification. And they reach the same conclusions there. Even in the absence of recognized confounders, so they don't really know what's going on. They caution that current accuracy numbers are brittle and susceptible to even minute natural variations in the data distribution. And this is clearly a problem we need to sort of like tackle and ideally solve if we want to deploy machine learning broadly, right? A lot of the applications we would like to deploy machine learning in are safety critical applications like transportation and healthcare. We just talked about that the past year. I spent the Toyota research because I wanted to learn more about robotics, online content moderation, and so on. So in all of these cases, you really do want machine learning to be reliable. Okay, good. Um, so how, what can we do to make the models more reliable and how reliable are the models at the moment in various ways? So this is going to be the topic of this talk. This is going to be in two parts. And I'll always emphasize the key role of data, the key role data sets play. In the first part of the talk, we'll do a broad overview over the robustness landscape with a focus on image classification, um, because this is where a lot of this work has happened. And here we'll use data sets in order to evaluate models in interesting ways. And a key outcome of the first part will be that train, data sets also on the training side play a very important role in making the models more robust. And in the second part of the talk, we'll look at the sort of probably most impressive example of that so far, OpenAI's club model, and see how we can use better training data to make the models more robust. And overall, what I think comes out as a conjecture on this, that work on the training data side is for some of these distribution shifts really the only way forward. Like sometimes when we think about robustness of the approaches, okay, if we come up with a better training algorithm and extract more signal out of our training set, we can make the model more robust. After working on this for a while, I think for some of the distribution shifts, this may just be impossible. And the only way forward is really studying training sets and coming up with better training sets. Okay. Cool, so let's get started. And throughout the talk, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so the first part of this talk, as I said, this overview of the robustness landscape. This is based on this paper here that I wrote back when I was a postdoc here at Berkeley. So the first author, Rohan Toori, who was actually at the time an undergrad, super fantastic. Archal Dave, Baishal, Nicholas, Ben, and myself. And what we wanted to do in this paper is 
sort of like get an overview of all the different ways people were measuring robustness at the time and still an image classification. Um, I think some of these, probably many of you have seen before, sort of like the most common way people have studied robustness and image classification over the past few years is adversarial examples. You take an image that a classifier easily classifies correctly, you add a little bit of carefully tuned noise, and then the uh, classifier says something completely nonsensical. Another type of robustness that people study is sort of like consistency of predictions in, across time and videos. Like you have this bunny here eating a toast. And if you look at the frames before and after in a video, sometimes the classifier gets it perfectly right. And sometimes again, it says something purely nonsensical. Now there is no adversarial play. And yeah, this is clearly an issue if you want reliable predictions over a video. This is another type of robustness that people have studied a lot. You take a test set that you have, like ImageNet, and you apply various corruptions, like say, add Gaussian noise, add a synthetic rain pattern, add a synthetic fog pattern, and so on. And typically, again, accuracies go down. This one we'll talk about in more detail. I call this data set shift here, when people just come up with new test sets and then feed them into the classifiers um, to understand how this model does on a completely new test set. There are many more things like geometric transformations. You take these images, you sort of like rotate them, translate them. Maybe you even render them in different ways if you have a 3D setup and a renderer. And overall, there's just lots of work in this area. Nicholas Kalini. I think he even read all the abstracts until 2019 and kept track of the papers, and there was a lot of activity. Good. And so for now, I want to, or for this paper, we wanted to see, okay, like are these different robustness notions? If a model does better in one of these robustness notions, does this also help for other robustness notions and so on? And we did all of this in the context of ImageNet. So this is, I think, a good starting point here because we have a lot of common test beds for ImageNet models, a lot of these distribution shifts. We are studied first in the ImageNet context, and often findings that you have on ImageNet also transfer to other data sets. We look at other data sets a bit later, but for now the focus is on ImageNet. Everyone by now knows what ImageNet is. It's a large image classification data set, 1 million training images, 1,000 classes, and the task you have to do is just take a picture like this dog and classify it as a golden retriever. Okay, so what is the core sort of like object of study in this paper? It's this matrix, okay? What is this matrix? Basically, this is our big evaluation grid. So what we have here on the y-axis are 200 different models. Basically, we try to evaluate everything that we could find on GitHub. If someone had put out a pre-trained image model, we plugged it into our testnet. And then on the x-axis, we have 200 different distribution shifts. Same idea. If someone had proposed a way to evaluate image net model, we plugged it into our testnet, and this gave us a new column. Okay, so overall, each cell in this matrix corresponds to evaluating one model on one test set. And then if you do this, you get about a billion image evaluations. Um, Nicholas at Google was helpful with sort of like giving us some compute to do this. And yeah, so just to give you a little bit more detail what's in this test set, let's first look at the y-axis. What kind of models do we have? So at a high level, let's divide this into three categories of models. The first one is what we call standard models. These are models that were just built to do well on ImageNet, sort of like starting from AlexNet over BGG, ResNet, and so on, this entire zoo of models, where the sole focus of the corresponding paper was to get a higher image number. And the second class of models is what we call robust models. These are all sorts of models that people developed with the focus on making the model robust to something. What they made the model more robust to, this varies depending on what the authors were targeting, but this is, for example, adversarial training or randomized smoothing, special data augmentation, special filtering layers, and so on. And then the third category of models that we have in a test bit are models trained on more data. We'll talk about the exact details of this when they become relevant, but this is sort of like the rough structure on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have, as I said, a ton of different distribution shifts, various test sets that people proposed. We'll talk about those in more detail. L-infinity attacks of various strengths, L2 attacks of various strengths, various image corruptions, and so forth. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff <laughs> in this test set. The nicest, once you, once you start building this, you get sort of like this quadratic increase in how many interesting things you can find. Um, for today, the focus is on one distinction that I think is quite important with the, on the x-axis of the distribution shifts. And this is what we sort of at a high level 
call the distinction between synthetic distribution shifts and natural distribution shifts. What do I mean by this? So with synthetic distribution shifts, we mean distribution shifts that someone really just created in a computer. You take the, say, image in a test set, and then you apply some perturbation to each image. Let's say you add an adversarial perturbation, or you add Gaussian noise, and so on. And this is a good starting point, because this makes it easy to come up with many different distribution shifts. But the catch is the resulting test set is not a real image. Like, no one ever recorded that image. And so in contrast to that, what we call a natural distribution shift is a test set that someone really collected in the real world. Like every image there is an unperturbed example that someone just took up as a picture with their camera, and we'll see how well the models do on that. And I think this distinction is important because a lot of the robustness work so far has focused on this world here. As I said, this is a natural starting point, so a controlled setup. But in the end, we want to make sure that the models are actually more robust than real data. And I think this is why complementing evaluations of natural distribution shifts is important. Cool. Any questions so far on the setup? Yes. Some of the data sets were actually attacks. So we, we actually, were these video valid attacks, or is it one more of this static data set? No, no, we're, we're for, for the distribution shifts where we say LP, adversarial example, L infinity with a certain strength, we actually ran PGD for each model. Good question. Thanks. Okay, cool. So before we look at the results for some of these distribution shifts, we need to agree on one more thing. And this is how we are going to quantify robustness. And once you, if you build such a large test bed of models, the tricky part is that in distribution accuracy becomes a confounder. Like to illustrate this with a simple example, let's say we have two models, model A and model B. Model A gets 80% accuracy, model B gets 90% in distribution. And then we look at the out of distribution test set, model A gets 75%, model B 77. So which of these two models is the more robust one? If you just pragmatically approach this, well, I want to deploy the best model, you should clearly go with model B because model B still has higher accuracy out of distribution. But if we are more interested in um, consistency across distribution shifts and how well these models do, then the model A is actually more interesting because model A sees only a five percentage point accuracy drop and model B sees a 13 percentage points accuracy drop. And so this is why we look primarily at accuracy drops across distribution shifts. And the nice thing is that for all of the distribution shifts we study, this is also a very regular way of looking at robustness. Why is that? What do I mean by this? So now let's start looking at some concrete data in our test. Bed. So X, these are sort of these scatter plots are going to be a key element in this talk. So let's go through the step by step. X axis is ImageNet, top one accuracy, so in distribution. Y axis is ImageNet V2 or some other out of distribution test set. And every point in this plot is one model that we've evaluated. Okay. And these are the blue points are always the standard ImageNet models. So these are models just trained to do well on ImageNet. And the interesting thing here is for some reason, we don't know exactly why, all of these models follow a very clean linear trend. Okay. As I said, we don't exactly know why this happens, but it happens basically, it happens for all models that we plugged on. And this basically now gives you a baseline for evaluating robustness. If a new model comes in, we can just look at, okay, what is this in distribution accuracy? Then we look at our linear trend. We can read off what the model should be getting out of distribution if it behaves like a standard model. And then what we would like for a model to achieve is that it gets what we call effective robustness. Basically, we say a model is truly more robust here if it's above the red line by some amount. Ideally, the more you are above the red line, the better. And why is this a reasonable goal? So ideally, you would be on y equals x, the dashed line, right? So this same performance on the two test sets. And this is a reasonable goal because humans can do it, right? And this entire robustness business, sort of like the disappointment is always that the models aren't quite as reliable as the human visual system. And um, for this image to image to be two distribution shift, we run an experiment with trained expert labelers and they actually do land here. So if we want to be as robust as humans, you would like large effective robustness so that we also land over there. Okay, and then the big question is, do any of the current robustness interventions or more data models have effective robustness on these distribution shifts? Oh, 
Okay, so let's look at some let's look at some data. We look at four natural distribution shifts in our test bed: image net v2, object net, image net sketch, and image net r. To be clear, there's a lot more people have done in the community on evaluating models and out of distribution data. Like two examples here that are very nice: are the wilds collection of benchmarks and breeds. Um, the problem with those is that you need to train models specifically for these data sets. The nice thing with the ImageNet based test set is you can just plug in everything that people have tra trained on ImageNet and you can evaluate it in various ways. Okay, cool. So the first test that we are going to look at is ImageNet v2. This is from a paper that I also did during my postdoc here. Here the idea was, let's try to recreate the ImageNet data set creation process as closely as possible as we could at the time. So ImageNet was built from Flickr as an image source cleaned with mechanical Turk. Then you get some accuracy at the time when we did this, top one was 83% for the best model. And then we repeated this and we only got 72%. So this is not exactly IID. So small differences do creep in when you do this, especially on the MTurk side. The point is just that this 11 percentage point accuracy drop in the context of ImageNet is actually quite large. This corresponds to about five years of progress on the data set. And ideally, a robust model wouldn't have this flaw because humans don't have it. Wait, yes. So it's, you're just taking the same images and you're just having them clean in two different. It's not exactly the same images. Thanks for clarifying. Basically, we got new images out of Flickr. So the data source for the original image that test set is Flickr. Yeah. And then they used MTurk to sort of filter the Flickr images because it's quite noisy. So we did the same. We got new images out of Flickr similar time frame and so on. You have a lot of control with the Flickr API. And then we also did a very similar MTurk process to filter the images. So it's not exactly the same images, but the same source. And we also use the same keywords in the Flickr API and so on to make it as similar as a distribution as possible. Okay. All right. So what is the, it, 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 you said it is the same source. So you went it is not, I mean, we, you can match all these things. And so there's a big question, like, what is actually different, right? Because if it was exactly the same distribution, you wouldn't see this 11% there. And I think this is a great question. Um, I think the current evidence points towards small differences in the MTurk setup. Like, there are variables, like, how do you exactly set up the task? How much do you pay the workers? What, I mean, the worker population also changes over 10 years, right? We did this in 2018. They built ImageNet in 2008. So the type of people who did MTurk back then is different motivations change and so on. I think this actually is the key. Okay, to be very precise there, the uh, ImageNet, the test set was built until 2012. We took images from mid 2012 when ImageNet was fixed, the ImageNet test set was fixed to mid 2013. So there is a one year temporal distribution shift. Why did we do it? Because we didn't want to overlap with the ImageNet um, period, because then the confounder would have been, what if ImageNet took out all the easy images and only the hard images are left in the Flickr data source? So we said, okay, let's use a different time period because then we don't have any overlap with ImageNet. And one year temporal shift shouldn't be a big difference here because ImageNet was built over multiple years anyway. But this could also play out. I think, yeah, I'm happy to chat more about this later. I think it's the M-trackers. Uh, but it would also be interesting to look at the time variation in more detail. Cool. Yes, question. Yeah, so if I'm right, this is uh, like you trained on the first data set and then you test on the second one. Did you try the other way around? Um, we did this in the context of our new CIFAR 10 test set, not in the context of the ImageNet test set, because building these data sets takes a lot of time and we only build a test set. Like the test set is like 10,000, the training set is 100 times larger, a size of a million. Would love to do it. Um, if you give me the money to do it, I do it. Um, cool. Great point. Okay, so let's look at our results plot here. Okay, this is now all 200 models on this plot ImageNet versus ImageNet v2. And now when you look at this, you're going to think that maybe like, ha, huh, this really looks a bit like the plot I've just seen before. There's not that much action going on in the sense that all models are still very close to the red line. And yes, this is the correct observation. So basically, none of the robustness interventions that we currently have don't really do anything for the ImageNet v2 distribution shift. The only models that stand out a little bit are the green points. So these are um, here. And these, as we said, are models trained on more data. 
a bit more specifically, this point here is trained on ImageNet 21K, so the larger full ImageNet training set, 10 times more images. And these are two, or these are a range of models trained by Google and Facebook. So Instagram, 1 billion, this is trained by Facebook on well, the name suggests 1 billion images. And this one here is trained by Google on 300 million images. So this is now a thousand times more training data than ImageNet. And the gain you get here is one to two percentage points. The drop is about 10. So this is far from closing the gap. Uh, the, oh yeah, these Instagram, these are new images. Yeah. No, this is the same. This is the same, roughly the same data set creation process. So when, it's funny, when they did the image net competition in 2012, they actually used a subset of the data they had already collected. So this is really roughly the same creation process and time period. JFT, I don't know. This is Google proprietary. Cool. Okay, so maybe there's something special about ImageNet v2, and I don't, we don't know to what extent this is a representative distribution chip. So the good news is over the past few years, many more teams built um, test sets like ImageNet v2. One nice one, for instance, is ObjectNet. This is from a team around Josh Tenenbaum at MIT. And um, here the idea was, let's actually directly challenge the model. So ImageNet v2 was more like, let's be as friendly to the models as possible. Here now they were like, okay, we want to see how robustly models generalize. And what they did is as follows, this is a very nice idea. They just told crowd workers, um, hey, take an object in your home, like a chair, chair is an object in ImageNet, and put it in an unusual orientation in an unusual place. The idea being that often dining chairs are more in the kitchen and they wanted to break the correlation. So they told people, rotate a chair by 90 degrees and put it in a bathroom and so on. So it's always still the right object. The idea is as a human, you can tell what it is, but you remove a lot of the correlations that are present in ImageNet. Okay, great. So let's plug this into our test bed. Let's run the 200 models on this and see what we get. So this is the plot we get. And sort of like, as a first approximation, this again looks like the plot we've just seen with the one big difference that now the drop is much larger. So for ImageNet v2, the drop was about 10 percentage points, 10 to 12, and now here it's more like 30 or 40. And then again, none of the models have a lot of effective robustness. Everything is pretty close to this red line. The only points that stand out a little bit, again, are the green points here trained on more data. Okay, and then let's look at two more, ImageNet Sketch and ImageNet R. Um, so in ImageNet Sketch, the idea was, well, let's just see how well the ImageNet classifiers do in sketches. They collected, I think, from Google Image Search, sketches corresponding to a subset of the ImageNet classes and then ImageNet R, which is from Berkeley here. This is sort of like a supercharged version of ImageNet Sketch where they have various types of renditions, not only sketches, but also models. A couple of points here that are above the line, these are various data augmentation methods. So they help here. And the yellow points, they are now um, a separate color. This is adversarial training. So they do offer quite a bit of um, effective robustness here. They're quite a bit of, of the red line. The thing to keep in mind is this model here, if you don't do adversarial training, is roughly over here. So you're not actually gaining out of distribution. You're basically making the model worse in distribution, but you maintain its out of distribution accuracy. And then you can look at ImageNet R, right? We said these two are roughly uh, or similar in terms of what they test. Actually, I think ImageNet Sketch is a subset of ImageNet R and similar story here. The more data models are doing the best, a couple of the data augmentation methods also help. And then there are the adversarial robust models here that for some reason, I don't know why, get a good amount of effective robustness, but it's not something you would actually do. Okay, good. So this is what's happening on the natural distribution shifts. Just for completeness, let's also look at the synthetic distribution shifts in our test bed um, because we have that data. And we look at two plots, one for ImageNet C and one for um, adversarial robustness. So ImageNet C are these corruptions here in the picture. And um, these image corruptions, this is now where data augmentation really shines. So if again, look at this scatter plot, the brown points here are all various forms of data augmentation. They have the largest effect of robustness, the largest lift above the line. And interestingly, 
The models trained on a lot more data, the green points that really stood out on the natural distribution shifts. They don't have any noteworthy properties here anymore. They just behave like a normal image in a trained model. And then one last plot, this is um, the L infinity and L2 attacks. And this is now where adversarial training shines because this is what it's trained to do. So like you have these models here, randomized smoothing and adversarial training, which are doing really well. And then the other models are doing substantially worse. Okay, so like what is the takeaway from all of this? So on these natural distribution shifts, we have four or five examples of them now. Um, most of the robustness interventions don't really work that well. Sometimes data augmentation helps, but the best thing by far is always just training on larger, more diverse data sets. But even for these models, training on a thousand times more data, there's still a lot of room for improvement, right? We said the emission v2 accuracy drop is 10 percentage points. Training on a thousand times more data only gives you two percentage point improvement. If you want to look at more of this data, we have sort of like a plotting. Web UI, you can go to robustness.imagenetv2.org and generate all 10,000 plots you can do with the test bed. Um, yeah, for now, this is overall, I think, a little bit, so like for me at least when I saw this was a little bit sobering and not really great news, but this is also happening in other places where people do large scale robustness evaluations. There's a very nice paper from people at Facebook in search of lost domain generalization. Dimensionalization is a closely related problem to the zero shot robustness that we look at in this talk. And they basically find the same thing. They say in the abstract, we conduct intensive, uh, extensive experiments using domain bed, this is their new benchmark, and find that when carefully implemented, empirical risk minimization shows state of the art performance across all data sets. So basically, they had a couple dozen methods implemented for dimensionalization, and they found that a well-run standard empirical risk minimization that doesn't really take robustness into account that as well or better than all of the domain generalization methods. Okay, cool. So all of this is very focused uh, question. Uh, you say well about your prediction. So when you predict, you take the test image, do you apply the augmentation and make a vote? Or do you predict just... Oh, you mean like what about test time augmentation? You mean like what about test time augmentation as a method? Um, that's a good question. I, I probably we tried this at some point. I don't remember if it's one of the 200 models, but I don't, and I don't think test time augmentation helps more than standard training augmentation. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, what about other fields um, of computer vision? So this was at the moment very centered on image classification. Um, and basically at a high level, similar phenomena show up in different places. There's a paper earlier this year where they do a similar study in MRI reconstruction. They plot it a bit differently, but you also see this like linear trend and all the models basically you see an accuracy drop by roughly the same amount. Because I was looking at robotics over the past year, we did something with pose estimation. So we want to estimate the 60 pose of an object. Similar story there. This is from people at Google led, led by Becker. And they looked at distribution shifts and object detection, similar story there. So you get these nice linear trends and models tend to follow the same linear trend. I think that if anyone has any ideas for when and why this is happening, I would be very curious. We actually wrote an entire paper on this. We don't have time to go into all the details here, but basically we look at just a lot of different distribution shifts and you often see this nice behavior that basically all the models do the same thing. The only thing that matters for your out of distribution accuracy is your in distribution accuracy. Um, so this one here, okay, the, this one here, these are trained on two different um, training sets. So this is always a property of the training distribution. Like all of these models that follow the same linear trend, they are trained on the same training distribution. And this is robust under all sorts of things you can do. You can early stop, you can change your hyperparameters. I think this is a particularly nice one. You can also just train on a subset of your data and you go exactly along this red line. So if I train on only 2% of the CIFAR 10 data in this example, I'm exactly for, uh, moving along the red line. And this is going to be useful later. This is going to be actually really useful because this allows you to make statements about much larger training sets 
from training on very small training sets, right? If this is a very reliable scaling law, then we should be able to run all of our experiments on like 1% of the data. And in the end, be able to say what's going to happen on all of the data. And we'll do this in about five minutes. Cool. And also just for completeness, not all distribution shifts have this property. I don't know when this happens. As I said, we'd be super happy to chat about when and why this happens. This is one example from the Wiles test bed. This is tissue classification, and that scatter plot is just a total mess. Um, some of the synthetic distribution shifts are also pretty messy. This is adding Gaussian noise. It's a bit ironic. The one distribution shift I can describe mathematically, you just add Gaussian noise to each pixel, gives you the messiest scatter plot. But okay, this is what's going on there. Oh, yeah, since we, again, so far everything has been focused on computer vision. We did similar experiments in NLP, building new test sets for question answering data sets. And again, similar trends drop there as well. Yes. This again, sort of time. Like, did you test on you know, images, you train on images from one time period and test it on time, um, time, 10, 10 years later or something? Uh, I would love to do this. This is definitely a good experiment to do. We didn't do that because um, we don't have timestamps for all of the ImageNet training images. In order to do that, you would need to know for the ImageNet training set when was the picture taken, and that information is not available. For well, question answering, you can do different time periods. Here, what we did was different source corpora, like instead of only Wikipedia, we also New York Times rather than Amazon. Yeah, you can definitely do this. It's a good amount of work. Like, like one of these papers usually is like about a year of work building these test sets and so on. But yeah, no, would be a great question. Okay, cool. Yes, sorry. Oh, um, this is John, Carl, and me, basically. The authors of the paper. We also tested ourselves. So, what is the method? That, I mean, the, the method is. The method seems very different. Right? I mean, oh, yeah, it's humans. It's myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, we wanted to make sure that ideally, like humans are on y equals x in these plots. Here, we are a little bit below. So, the data quality for the OOD tested is not exactly where you would want it to be. Ideally, the humans are on the dashed line. Um, but basically, this is just indicating that yes, you can do better on OOD than the models currently do. I mean, I'm trained for 30 years now, but yeah. Uh, we did not train on the OOD test sets, no. We, we trained on, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to call it training because I was heavily pre-trained, but um, we did a bit of training on the squad training set just so we learn how the task works and some of the nuances. And then we tested ourselves on these test sets. The same for the ImageNet evaluation. Okay. Time wise, we have about five minutes. We need to go a little bit faster. But these are all great questions. Any more questions? Okay, so so far we have seen that these natural distribution shifts tend to be a pretty hard problem. And none of the methods so far made progress, except there's one big outlier that appeared earlier this year. And this is OpenAI's clip model. And this was super surprising, partially because of the following plot here, right? I just showed you this. And we said that even training on a thousand times more data gives you only small robustness gains on this test set, right? If you sort of like do a silly extrapolation, maybe two percentage points for a thousand times more data, then you need to like 10 to the 10 times more data or something in order to close this gap. This is clearly not realistic. But the interesting thing is that you can actually do much better. So this is the clip paper from earlier this year where OpenAI trained models jointly on language and vision. So basically images with associated text to supervision. And they just did extremely well on these OOD test sets. So what they did in this paper is very nice. They followed exactly our recipe for evaluating robustness. So you take your clip model that you just trained, you compare it to an ImageNet trained model as the same accuracy. So these differences are effective robustness, what they show you here. And these numbers are just really large, like six percentage points on ImageNet V2. This is half of the drop, and then plus 50% on ImageNet R, plus 40 on ObjectNet, plus 35 on ImageNet Sketch, and 74, we haven't looked at another OD test set on ImageNet A. Uh, like if you work in machine learning, you know that it's very rare to get plus 50% gains on these like competitive test sets just because they can't happen too often, right? If we did this twice, then the data set would be solved. Um, 
this was my live reaction in a chat on Slack with friends when this came out. And yeah, I just, I still find this like super, super interesting. And then when you scatter plot these models that they have, the clip models, they actually, this is straight out of their paper again. Um, you basically see that they are really qualitatively very different. Like the orange line is sort of like baseline. These are the clip models they propose, evaluated in a consistent way. And you get this nice linear trend again. I don't know why. And it's just much, much better than the ImageNet models, the blue line, or all of the more data models that people have proposed before, the green points. And yeah, good. I mean, like, what do you do with this? Um, or like, why is it so good? And the interesting thing is when you look at sort of like figure one in the paper and how this model is trained, nothing about this method is explicitly focusing on robustness. Like this is sort of like the architecture. You show this to a first year grad student and they will know what's going on. Oh, okay, text encoder, transformer, contrast the flaws, image encoder, confident or transformer, done. So the method is very, very simple. I think this is part of the beauty here. And I think this strongly points towards training data really being the key for why this model is so good. Yes. Oh, fine tuning, great question. Um, we'll get to that. Um, I mean, okay, you can fine tune just by using a last layer that you get from your text encoder and then doing either last layer or end-to-end -end fine tuning. No, but uh, are you fine tuning on the whole data? Um, oh, for, yeah, great question. So when you fine tune here, this is actually what our contribution is here, probably only two minutes for that, but anyway, if you, they basically took their models and then they fine tuned them on image. And then you get the red line. And you were asking like- What is the orange line here? The orange line is just zero shot evaluation of these models. Yes, this is the zero shot evaluation of these models. This is what you get after fine tuning on the ImageNet. On ImageNet, okay. And, and, and you know what they train, they know whether ImageNet factored into the data? Um, like this ImageNet a subset of their training set? I don't think so. I've never asked them this specifically. I know some things about their test at their training set, but overall their training set is private. Okay, and sort of here, since we talk about fine tuning, this somewhat unfortunate thing is if you fine tune these models on ImageNet, you do get quite a bit better in distribution on ImageNet, but you actually even lose some of the robustness. What would be ideal is if you just moved further along the orange line, but actually what happens is that you even lose some of the out of distribution performance. So the question we asked ourselves, was can you do better? Can you improve both in distribution and out of distribution accuracy when you fine tune? And the answer is yes. And I'm in the interest of time, not going to tell you anything about this because Mitchell and Gabriel are here and they have a poster, I think, and the poster session this afternoon and can, you more, can tell you more about the details. The point here is with a very simple method, you can actually substantially improve over the results from OpenAI. So, this is what they told us to do for end-to-end fine-tuning. And then our improved fine-tuning gets nine percentage points better out of distribution. So this is a pretty large gain on top of the already large gains they have. And maybe just one point here that I want to highlight because I think this is very, very nice. And this is sort of not actually how the method works, but how we got there. So what this plot shows you is the robustness gain of our fine-tuning method as a function of compute amount you put in. And as I told you, these linear trends and these plots are really reliable scaling laws. So what we actually did was a lot of experimentation in the small to medium regime compute wise, because we are at UW, we don't have as much computers open AI, actually far less compute. But the cool thing is, if you find a model of effective robustness in this low compute regime, there's a really good hope that this will transfer over to the much more expensive high compute regime. And this is exactly how we did this. So Mitchell and Gabriel, a super creative experimentalist, they found a method that worked in this low accuracy regime. And then we just sent this to our collaborator, Chong Wook at OpenAI and asked him, hey, can you run this on your largest model like with all the compute you have basically? And this worked on the first try. So this is nice because this really allows you to do model design on a small scale and then just scale things up and you know that things should work out. Okay, cool, yeah, this is more on this. We don't have time for that now. Cool, so this is basically everything I wanted to tell you and we're also at 40 minutes, so that's good. Um, let's go quickly to this conjecture because this is something if someone, anyone has insights on this, I would be super happy as I mentioned. Basically, when we make these scatter plots, everything falls on these linear trends. Like you can do random forests here, random features, convnets, 
linear regression, Gaussian kernel, it doesn't matter. It also goes exactly to 10%, 10%. So even a random classifier is on this line that all the models fall on. And I don't know why this is. And I wonder if this is some sort of like fundamental limitation of training only on the CIFAR 10 training set that you inherently can't do better than this red line on an out of distribution test set. Same thing sh shows up on ImageNet, we've seen this. The tricky part is it's actually really trivial to get away from this red line in a pretty nonsensical way. You can just take any point here on this line and you interpolate it with a random classifier. This is a little technical now. You've maybe noticed that the plots look a bit weird in terms of scaling. These are actually in logic domain. The lines are only lines in logic domain. And then interpolating with a random classifier sort of like traces out something above the red line. The thing is, yes, this is above the line, but it's also a pretty stupid thing to do because interpolating with a random classifier only makes your model worse. So yeah, as I said, if anyone has thoughts on this, please let me know. Um, for now, let's conclude. So first part of the talk, we did this high level overview of robustness. And it's pretty clear from that, that some robustness notions are basically orthogonal, like adversarial robustness and these natural distribution shifts kind of have nothing to do with each other. Improving on one doesn't help you with the other or vice versa. On the other hand, there are some consistent trends among some of the distribution shifts, like ImageNet v2, ObjectNet, ImageNet R, ImageNet Sketch, they all behave roughly the same, which I think is good news. I think overall, we just need to understand a lot more about how these different robustness notions interact. And then sort of in the second part of the talk, we've seen that training data allows you to make tons of progress on these distribution shifts. And I think this raises a question, how do we construct sort of universal training sets that have coverage over a wide variety of different test sets? Um, yeah, and I'm happy to take more questions now. As I mentioned, if you like scatter plots now, you can plot a lot of them on robustness.imagenet.v2.org. And I'm, thanks for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Questions for Ludwig. Um, so, on some of the earlier plots, uh, on some of the earlier plots, uh, you were able to do better with that augmentation, but also some of the plot points much below the line were also data augmentation. Yes. Or, or more using more training data. Um, do you know if there's like a systemic difference between the date, the additional training data that you found? Yeah. So this is. The thing with some of these more data models, we basically take the checkpoints that large companies like Google or Facebook release, and we don't know exactly what's going on. One indeed funny phenomenon is that some of these more data points are below the line. I think they're all from the same team at Google. I don't know exactly what they do, but I think they fine tune their models in a funny way. I think they may fine tune them too much on ImageNet, and then maybe it does worse on other tests. I don't know. It's a good question. We've definitely noticed this, that um, yeah, like also, uh, you, as I said, you can go to this website and mouse over these points to see exactly what they are. Um, it's a good question. Like one funny thing is, there's one blue point here that stands out a lot. Sorry, on ObjectNet. If you go back to, if you go back to ObjectNet, you're like, okay, all of the blue points are roughly on the line, and then there's one sort of like maybe even five percentage points above. What is going on with this guy here? And it turns out this is a model we imported from a Google trained test bed. And this one here was trained with rotation as state augmentation. And then if you go back to how ObjectNet was built, yes, it's about rotations. So all of the, like rotation is not a standard image net data augmentation, normally just do translations and flips. Seems like the rotation does help here. It's like in general, sort of like to be fair to data augmentation, if you know what your distribution shift is, you should totally just data augment with this. This is a very good pragmatic way of going about it. What I'm interested in here research-wise are the distribution shifts where I don't know how to date augment. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick clarification question. So what's the whisker represent in all your plots? Oh, this is these are just 95% uh, confidence intervals. Uh, for, 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 for the test set size, like the test sets have finite size. We are estimating a population accuracy from a finite size test set. So there's some uncertainty from that. So these are just binomial proportion confidence intervals. I see, thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, let's thank 
Ludwig again. Next talk is Nati at 11.